Thanks for joining us today. I'm Jonathan Brunt. I'm the government editor of the Spokesman Review. And with me is Senator Mark Mullet, a Democratic candidate for Washington governor. Thank you very much for joining us. Hey, happy to be here. Thanks. Right. Great. Well, um, first thing I want to do is just ask you to do, just give us your, you know, one minute pitch. If people just listen to the first minute, I, you know, why <laughs> they vote for you uh, in the uh, August primary. Yeah, I like it. The, I would say the main four candidates in the race, I'm the only one who has a track record and I'm pretty, I acknowledge this of I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm socially liberal. And so the example is like, I 100% support women's reproductive rights and marriage equality. I have a voting record to go with that. At the same time, I voted against the long-term care payroll tax. I'm actually supporting the initiative to make that optional. And I think the reality is you can see right there just from those three issues, it kind of puts me at odds with both parties on different things, right? Because the fiscal conservative part of me can put me at odds with my own party on the Democratic side. And obviously, because I'm socially supportive of those core issues that I think Washington voters support, that can put me at odds with Republicans. But I honestly do feel there is a giant chunk of the population of Washington state who feels very similar to how I feel on those issues. And our campaign has been focused on affordability and public safety. I am endorsed by all the law enforcement organizations in our state. And I think that speaks volumes of the fact that they know that I have been willing to stand up my own party to acknowledge we should be doing better on public safety. And, and affordability for me is really personal because of our six kids. Isabel, the oldest, is finishing school next year. And we're nervous how she's going to afford to live in the Puget Sound. This is where my wife and I were born and raised. So this was really hitting home for us. If we don't have a better affordability lens in Olympia, up to be better financial partners with cities and counties on public safety. And I don't think it matters where you are on the political spectrum. You're happy in the state of Washington if you start to make progress on those two issues. And that's been my focus in this campaign. Okay. All right. Well, I, I want to, uh, because there have been a couple recent national events. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'd want to just at, talk to you about that a little bit. Um, you know, obviously this weekend the uh, in Pennsylvania um, with, uh, with the shooting of President Trump, assassination attempt what do you think our political climate needs to change and if so how should it change and have you participated in that it does need to change i mean i think i i always say in olympia you can disagree without being disagreeable that's how i've tried to operate during my 12 years in the senate and and i think the events this saturday were horrific i mean i think i was like all americans i was glued to the tv trying to get more information it reminded me I think when Hinckley tried to assassinate President Reagan back in the early 80s, I was a young kid, like nine or 10 years old, but that's still kind of implanted in my brain, that whole memory. And, and it would be nice to have a generation of youth that doesn't have any recollection of their memory of, of a president or ex-president or somebody running for president trying to be assassinated. And, you know, we've gone quite a while without something like this happening. And I think it's really unfortunate what happened and, and my heart goes out specifically the firefighter who who lost his life there at that event on saturday it was really heartbreaking uh do you think uh there are things that politicians have need to do differently there is i don't know how you're going to make that happen i mean this is the most divided i've seen our country politically in a really long time and so I think everyone it sort of reminds me of, you know, when we have the Cold War between the U.S. and Russia, if you could agree that no one's going to have nuclear arms, you can make it work. Right. But everyone has to agree. And that's the challenge. Right. If one side agrees, we're going to back off. But the other side continues to have aggressive political attacks. Obviously, that agreement won't work. And so I just don't know how you're ever going to find this mutual agreement. And that's going to be the real challenge. And, and to be honest, like this is for me when I ran, like I think I have the best bipartisan record of anyone in the Senate for the last decade of working with both sides of the aisle to find solutions that have broad agreement politically. And this is, I wanted voters to have that choice. I didn't want their choice to just be the extreme left or the extreme right. This is the entire reason I'm in the race is I just wanted there to be one candidate on the ballot with a proven record in public office whose entire brand is being bipartisan. That is my entire brand in the Senate. And and I have that brand because I just don't find the current level of political vitriol healthy. It's not healthy for our country. It's not healthy for the state of Washington. 
Uh, the other uh, uh, national news item that it was starting to percolate a lot before this weekend was President Biden and his condition to be president. I know from past interview that you were a supporter of President Biden or have been. Uh, do you think he's competent to run for another four year term? Yeah, I was the first Democrat in the legislature to endorse President Biden in 2019. Uh, but I also, I, I think, was one of the first members of the legislature to come out and say, I think it's time to pass the torch to Vice President Harris. I mean, I came out publicly and said that because, you know, and this goes back to the debate we saw on June 27th. It goes back to the Stephanopoulos interview we saw the following week after those two events. I feel really strongly that the Democratic Party should be shifting to unite behind Vice President Harris as we go into the August convention and we'll see whether or not that happens or not. It's uh, it's tough. I mean, I will admit, Jonathan, these issues are really hard. Like our, you know, my dad passed away seven years ago and we started to notice after he passed away that my mom was going through cognitive decline and she got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And, and so for the last seven years, my older brother, my younger brother and I have been dealing with this and cognitive decline is really difficult and it's really difficult for the person experiencing it to ever acknowledge if it's happening at all. And I think that's the real challenge here. And, and I do feel, you know, it's hard at this age, I think in this debate, President Biden really had to get on that stage and just demonstrate to all of America that we shouldn't be worried at all about his cognitive health. And obviously I don't think that was the case from that debate. And that's why I'm supporting, you know, passing the torch on to Vice President Harris. I think she'd be more than capable of, of energizing and leading our party as he go forward in the next four months. Uh, one issue that's uh, pretty big in eastern Washington is the um, natural gas and its future yeah. in Washington and the possibility that might end up on the ballot. Tell us uh, what you think about the state's current efforts to um, de-emphasize natural gas and, and what you think of the potential um, initiative. So that bill was in front of us in the Senate. It was House Bill 1589. I I was one of two Democratic senators that did not support the bill. It still obviously passed regardless of me not supporting it. That's why the initiative is in front of us today. So I am supporting the initiative on that bill. I think the crux of it is we have to transition away from natural gas. That is a mathematical reality. Uh, the same time, like I put money in the capital budget, like I chair our state construction budget. I put 25 million to, to try to draw down federal money into Hanford for small modular nuclear. Our challenge is we need to get clean electrons on the grid. Like we can't just, if you transition away from natural gas before you have an abundance of new clean electrons hitting the grid, I think you get really bad outcomes on the affordability front. And this goes back to, like I said, Jonathan, the core of our campaign is having this affordability lens. And I think right now the challenge with the bill and obviously the initiative is addressing this it's just saying, yes, we're going to transition away from natural gas. The question is, are we going to put our thumb on the scale right now to accelerate that to the point where it's probably going to have financial impacts on ratepayers in Washington in a way that could be detrimental. And I think the more gradually you do it, the more you let these other clean sources of energy, that's wind, solar, hydro, and nuclear come online, I think the better off you can start to make that transition. So I think the transition is going to happen away from natural gas. It's just a question of timing. And I think the bill was accelerating that timing in a way that I think made voters uncomfortable. And, and my prediction is that initiative will pass. So at the, uh, you were a supporter, however, the Climate Commitment Act. Some folks argue that that has caused a significant gas tax or gas yeah. price increase. So uh, given your concerns about the potential for natural gas price or energy price spikes with natural gas. Explain what, uh, the Climate Commitment Act and why you support it. Yeah, so that bill passed in 2021. We put a lot of leeway for the governor's office how you implement that bill. And when I showed up to the Senate in January of 23, I started to get really nervous because unlike California, who did the similar legislation, we were not banning speculators from the early stage of the auctions. Unlike California, we were not phasing in the impacts to transportation fuels, i.e. gas we buy at the pump. So there's all these things we were doing that were completely different than what California had done. And I was raising this, the Department of Ecology, Ensley's administration, saying, guys, aren't you nervous that if you guys go forward in your current plan, you're going to end up with really high auction prices, hence really high gas price increases? And, and it was just 
we, we parted ways at that point. So I actually introduced legislation last fall that I think had we passed in a special session, I don't think the initiative would be in front of us today. That legislation just acknowledged climate change is real, but what's also real is the price of gas. <laughs> like you have to do both simultaneously. I hate the fact that we're getting put into this one or the other. It's like a binomial thing. If, if you're complaining about the price of gas, you don't care about climate change. I think that's nonsense. I know a lot of people who care significantly about climate change, but also want to do it in a way that our state stays affordable. And, and if you look at, you know, in August of 23, we had a $63 per ton climate auction. That is over 50 cent increase for every gallon of gas sold in the state of Washington. When we passed the bill, our estimate was our auctions would be going off at $23. So I think had the current administration targeted those auctions towards the price that we initially told people, and as the chair of the capital budget, I can invest those climate dollars. I was handed $1.8 billion going into session this year when I expected to have five or $600 million. Like to me, it was hubris to just drive up the price of gas as high as we did in the summer of 23 and not expect Washington voters to get frustrated with it. So I think there was a balancing act. We could have, we can generate five or 600 million a year to fight climate change. That'll have an impact to the pump that's more in that 10 or 15 cent a gallon range, not 50 cents a gallon. And that's what we have to strive for in our state is keep the bill alive, but do it in a way that isn't just trying to have the highest gas prices in the country, but just generating income for climate change investments, but minimizing the impacts of the pump. So there is a balance that we can we can achieve. Uh, kind of related. Uh, we're in a heat wave here. Um, and and uh, I sell ice cream for a living, so I, I, I kind of enjoy heat waves. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, wildfire is a big deal here. We've seen... Lots of destruction in Spokane County and throughout Washington and Eastern Washington. So um, what more should the state be doing? And uh, you can talk long term when it comes to climate change or short term. When I think for one, I think working forests tend to be healthy forests. So I think we still have to embrace. I'm a big believer in working forests, like in the sense that the best way to store carbon is in wood products and end up building houses. <laughs> like to me, we have this huge you know, history in our state of being a timber state, I don't want to ever lose that. And I think there is, from my own party, there is this kind of what I view as a slightly more extreme angle to this, which is let's quit harvesting trees for wood production and let's let trees just grow forever. I do think that those unmanaged forests can end up creating timber tinder boxes for a future forest fire, which is obviously bad for our economy obviously bad for the environment as well and everybody loses so i do think you have to and we've done this if i was to pick a place where the legislature stepped up we've stepped up and putting more money aside to fight firefighters in the state of washington the last four years and going forward i think we have to really embrace the concept of working for us where we're really managing kind of that growth at the ground level of what's in these forests to ensure they're not just creating tinder boxes that can spread quickly and I think that being said, we want to get through fire seasons. We do not want to become California. I mean, this is just not a healthy place. And I will say on a selfish level as somebody, you know, with four ice cream stores, like if you want to see a way to destroy ice cream sales, have smoke in the air. People don't want to go outside. They don't want to recreate. They don't want to do anything. I mean, it's bad for small businesses in our state. It's bad for the air quality. It's bad for everything. So as we continue to prioritize these investments in forest health, I think it will pay dividends. And I think the public is there and I, I think it's bipartisan support. So I think we have to continue on the path we are and keep making progress. But I, I really do want to reiterate, like I'm embracing having more working forests in our state. I really want to see the timber industry in Washington grow, not shrink. Um, what's your position on the Snake River dams and the potential of breaching them? I don't support breaching the dams. I think this would be a really bad time. The next 20 or 30 years, we're on a quest for clean electrons. And right now those four dams produce a lot of clean electrons. And, and so I don't see how we're talking about taking those clean electrons off the grid at a time when we're on a quest for more clean electrons. And so I 100% support making investments to improve fish passage on the Snake River to make sure that the fish can't actually spawn in their habitat. And I think we can make those investments in a way that keeps those dams operational for the next 20 or 30 years, because 
we've got a big energy transition coming up. And I don't think taking the Snake River dams offline is smart at this point in time. Okay. Um, another thing on the ballot, uh, capital gains tax. Uh, you were in opposition to that, as I recall. Can you explain? I, I assume your position is not different, but talk about <laughs> Your assumption is correct. I am voting on the initiatives. This is what's interesting. I'm the only one in this race, right, who actually has a public record on all those initiative votes. And I voted on them in the legislature. I'm the exact same. To me, we want elected leaders who are actually consistent. They're not political windsocks where actually you get to an election season, they start to hedge their bets of what they support and what they don't support. So go back to the 21 session. This was the largest budget surplus in our state's history. We had an $8 billion surplus at that point in time during the session. And I made it very clear to my colleagues, if we're going to use the capital gains tax revenue to lower property taxes, because that was a complaint as a senator in East King County, the complaint I was having was seniors coming to me on a daily basis saying, Mark, we're getting priced out of our home through these higher property taxes. I know that we care about public education, but we also want to be able to stay in our house. And so there was a really unique opportunity, I think, when the capital gains tax passed in 21 to actually use the revenue to lower another tax. If you want to make the taxes more progressive, don't just keep raising taxes. Raise a tax and lower a tax that people are really struggling with. People are struggling with the property tax. We had a golden opportunity in the 21 session to do that because we had a budget surplus. We weren't raising a tax to save childcare or other things, right? We were raising a tax at the largest budget surplus in state's history. There was never a better opportunity to actually provide property tax relief than when that bill passed. And I'll tell you, Jonathan, had we done that, I promise you, I promise you, this initiative would not be in front of us today. It would not have gotten the signatures. Had we actually used the revenue from capital gains to provide property tax relief, I think there would have been broad voter support for it across the political spectrum. But we did not do that, and the initiative is in front of us. And yes, I'm supporting that initiative. But if we come up with proposals where we want to raise progressive revenue, where we're going to use that to reduce property taxes, like, come talk to me because I'm interested in that bargain. I'm just not interested in raising taxes for the sake of raising taxes. Let's talk a little bit more broadly about Washington's tax structure. A lot of folks think it uh, burdens the lower middle incomes with no income tax, but you've got a B&O tax, which is widely unpopular. And you've got, um, you know, um, high sales tax and so forth. Um, if you could ha wave a magic wand... What, what kind of a tax structure would our state have? Well, as I learned in the Senate the last 12 years, there are no magic wands. So I think part of it is you have to live in political reality. And, and so the political reality is there is a distrust from the voters that if we raise one tax, we're going to lower another tax, and the tax we lower is actually going to stay lowered. And so that there is a distrust from the voters. So I think at the end of the day, to me, the policy we passed, which I supported, was this working families tax credit. And it, it was something that addressed the regressive nature of our sales tax by saying, if you're in the lower income brackets, you can file with the state for a rebate. You're, there's a high probability with the working families tax credit being funded now through the legislature that people on the lower income ranges are going to get a lot of their sales tax they pay back at the end of the year. And so I think we have actually addressed the regressive nature of our tax code. I don't think it's gotten a lot of press. And at the end of the day, though, once again, this is, like I say, I am socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Like, it's great. Like, when I got to the Senate in 2012, it's like, yes, gay marriage is on the ballot. Like, we're supporting women's reproductive rights. So like, Mark's a great Democrat. You then get to the 2019 session, and we start to have all these issues around higher taxes. And, yeah, I, I am very vocal with my own party saying we have to acknowledge that if we want our state to be affordable, we have to look at every single one of these tax proposals with a fine tooth comb. And I'm very nervous about talking about creating new taxes at a time when I think the average family in our state feels really stretched financially. And so what that ideal tax code looks like, but if you wanted to rebalance, we had a proposal to, to shift to a different version of the BNO. If you ever wanna do that, you have to hold harmless. So nobody goes backwards. Like if you wanna change our tax code, you can't just have these people win and these people lose because the people who lose be really vocal you would have to actually say okay we're going to change our tax code but we are going to hold harmless so it's not just winners and losers 
it's only winners now. And I think there is a path to do that, but that would take a certain level of fiscal responsibility that the state would have to strive for because the tax proposals I've seen to rebalance things in the Senate usually do involve winners and losers and they're not hold harmless. Who's your friend who just walked by? Oh my gosh, I have three dogs. So oh. <laughs> okay. I, I have Boots, I have Tucker and I have Arthur. Okay. I'm outnumbered. I went to session every day during COVID and worked out of my Senate office. <laughs> Not because of my six kids, it's because my three dogs are not cooperative to offline Zoom interviews. Okay, uh, I want to talk about fentanyl. We have quite a crisis in Washington State, Spokane. Um, what should the state? What more should the state be doing to, um, you know, lower this crisis that we're in? Yeah, I mean this. And this is the core reason I'm in the race, right? You go back to the 21 session, the Blake decision by our Supreme Court legalized possession of fentanyl and other drugs in our state. You know, and, and our Attorney General Bob Ferguson was urging the legislature to follow the path of Oregon. He wanted us to follow the path of British Columbia. He wanted us to go down the decriminalization route. I was the vocal Democratic senator who said, I disagree with Bob's position. I think we need to have accountability for people using drugs in public. And I was a co-sponsor and champion of Senate Bill 5536, which passed last year, which has the gross misdemeanor for people using drugs in public. It's a treatment focused bill, but it, it still has accountability for public drug use. But now I will go one step further. I think our missing link in our state is secure substance abuse treatment facilities. So when I did my ride along with Spokane Police, this was last September of, of 23, we were seven blocks from the Davenport, I saw someone OD on the sidewalk underneath a freeway overpass. They got brought back to life through Narcan, but the EMS technician on site said, I'm gonna, I saw that same person last week and I'll see that same person next week. And, and that's when it really hit me like a two by four over the head. Like we put people into substance abuse treatment programs where the front door is open. They just walk out when they wanna leave. And so we've checked a box saying, well, we tried to help them, but they left. Well, if you're using drugs in public, to me, I don't want you to go to jail for a year, but I want you to go into a secure substance abuse treatment facility where you could be in there for 30 or 45 days, but I want you to actually have the best possible chance to beat your addiction. And to me, if we do that, I think downtown Spokane, one or two years later, would look substantially different than it does now. I think Third Avenue in downtown Seattle would look substantially different than it does now. And, and my proposal, and I did a bill in the legislature to do exactly this, Share the $480 million of cannabis tax revenue we create every year. Share that with cities and counties, but with strings attached. Share it with cities and counties that want to make targeted investments in public safety and who are willing to invest to help people beat their drug addiction. I don't want a penny of our tax dollars going to enable people to use drugs. But if you want to beat your drug addiction, I want us to partner with every city and county to help make that happen for any resident of the state of Washington who decides, hey, I do want to try to beat my addiction. And I think we should financially step up, use our cannabis tax revenue to actually fight addiction. That's drugs like fentanyl, which are just mind bogglingly addictive and, and their negative impacts on Washington residents can't be overstated. The uh, If you diverted that cannabis revenue, wouldn't that cause some uh budget holes or problems elsewhere yeah you have to do things in a gradual manner like when i got to the senate the 2013 budget i voted on and supported was 34 billion dollars the budget that we passed march of this year was 72 billion dollars that's not a very long period of time right jonathan so from 2013 to 2024 our state budget went up by more than double, and it went up just by a simple math number of $38 billion. I mean, that was more than what it was actually generating in 2013 when I got there. So to me, you can't do any of these changes overnight, but gradually over time, if you think about that 480 million, if you had done it in a gradual approach, you could have actually shifted that money out to cities and counties on public safety efforts without, I think, having really negative impacts on the operating budget. You just can't do it all at once. So you have to phase in these these more holistic ways of looking at our budget gradually over time. Okay. Um, let's see on my list here, what I haven't gotten to. I, I want to ask about education funding. You know, there's a long debate of education funding here through Supreme Court cases um, and um, 
argument still that education is still underfunded? Do you think it is? Well, it's our biggest increase we've had you know, of any state in the country. If you went back to my time in the Senate, we've had the largest increase in K-12 public education funding of any state. I don't think anyone else is even close to us. We've literally doubled, I think, per pupil allotments. But we're still short. We're still short on special education. We're still short when it comes to transportation. I think those two items, I think the state can still step up. But my big takeaway is whenever we push out money now in the K-12 system, it has to have a lot of strings attached to it to make sure it's going into those specific areas. And I think, Jonathan, I feel very strongly. My wife is a public school teacher. My six kids have all gone through the public school. So once again, on education between Bob Ferguson and myself, there's a huge contrast because Bob went to private school and his kids would go to private school. Like, I don't think, I feel strongly our public K-12 system should be good enough for the governor's family. And to me, that's a really simple message, I think, for voters to think about when they fill out their ballots in this next week. But when you think about the money when it goes out, local levy dollars are supposed to be used for local programs, like before school programs, after school programs, paraeducators, private tutoring. But what I've seen in my wife's district, and I've seen this in every district across the state, is the state will do a cost of living adjustment for teachers, like for my wife in Issaquah, that was five and a half percent cost of living, you know, salary increase going in the fall of 22. And then they use their local levy dollars to do an additional 4% increase on top of the state increase. And that to me is the mindset that has to change. Like we, every one of those teachers in Issaquah deserve that five and a half percent cost of living adjustment increase in the fall of 22, but that extra 4%, it should have been going towards paraeducators. It should have been going to the before and after school programs. It should not have just been going to enhance the state COLA and make it even higher than it already was. And to me, this mindset has to change because every district is still struggling with this. They're doing these local cost of living adjustments in a world that existed before the McCleary decision. But ever since we solved McCleary, we've kind of put in our state constitution that every teacher is gonna get a raise every year to adjust for inflation. Like that's what we do automatically. Yet we're still using these local levy dollars to do additional cost of living adjustments above the one the state is doing. And when we do that, we're taking money out of the programs that are changing kids' life. We're taking money out of paraeducators. We're taking money out of these before and after school programs. This mindset has to change. And I'm really convinced when we change it, it'll be better outcomes for the kids. And I'll tell you, my wife, like when she lost her paraeducator support, it made her life miserable as a teacher. Like, I think the teachers actually want a more balanced approach <laughs> to say, hey, like the state's not going to get the money, right? The money's going to stay in that local district. It's just a question of, is it going to go to these programs to enhance things in the school or is it just going to go to add extra cost of living adjustments on top of the one the state already sends out? This is a real thing we have to grapple with at the local level in every school district. Right. Now, in the last few years, another big issue has been police reform in Washington. Um, uh, you know, uh, some of it's been rolled back to some extent. Um where where do you stand currently? Are there still are there still reforms that were made that you think need to be rolled back, um, or are there more reforms that are needed? So I think the two big reforms were rolled back was the police pursuit. I'm really glad we fixed that. I think reasonable suspicion versus probable cause was also addressed. Uh, that goes all the way back to the 22 session, and so those were big things we had to address. Once again, this is a big contrast between myself and Bob Ferguson. Bob has been the top cop in our state for the last 12 years. There's one single police organization endorsing Bob Ferguson for governor. They are endorsing Democratic Senator Mark Mullet. That's both law cops and law, our police chiefs and sheriffs, are endorsing Democrat State Senator Mark Mullet because I have stood up on these public safety issues. And, and if you were to highlight the one, this one's tough politically to even say out loud, but we did a bill in 21 with a right to counsel for youth. And so if you're under 18, you're guaranteed to talk to an attorney before the police can ask you any questions. I think when we passed that, our vision was to make sure youth who might end up incriminating themselves have a lawyer to kind of guide them through that process before they say too much. The unintended consequence is those lawyers in the last few years since we passed that bill their default to every youth, no matter what, is don't say anything. Never tell the police, even if you actually saw who committed the crime and exactly what happened, 
they're not sharing that information with the police because the right to counsel tells them don't say anything like you're and this to me now is the final issue if i were to look back of what we did in that 21 session that we still have to figure out how we're going to solve it is the youth right to counsel because you look at like we had a shooting in my neck of the woods here at garfield high school last month the only people who saw that shooting were were youth and so if they're all being told to the right to counsel just shut up and don't say anything how are we supposed to solve these crimes and actually get the shooter off the streets and have them be held accountable and so we have to find this balance of saying yes we want youth to have a right to counsel but at the same time if none of them are going to talk to police ever there are going to be so many unsolved crimes and i think it's not going to make our state safer so this is a tough area that we still have to address but I do feel proud that at least we had the intellectual honesty to admit that what we did on police pursuits was a step too far and now it's been fixed. So that's good. We have about five minutes left or so. I just want to uh, I want to ask you a little bit on the, the politics here. Um, yeah. You know, I think in the Seattle Times governor endorsement article, I, they kind of talk about, well, your campaign really hasn't taken off. Um, and uh you, you skipped the de state Democratic convention. Um, you've uh, filed some complaints against uh, your main Democratic opponent. Um, talk about, is the Democratic Party in Washington uh, open, I guess, to more moderate folks like yourself? Well, I think, and this is what I sort of opened with, right, is, I'm socially liberal and I'm fiscally conservative. And I meet people throughout our entire state that feel the exact same way as I do. What's really interesting, Jonathan, is those people then, some identify as Republicans, some identify as Democrats, right? That's the simple reality. But yes, like Democrats get frustrated. Like if you were to look at this last, you know, last session, there was a bill that people get unemployment insurance for going on strike. I thought that was, a, as a small business owner, I'm like, I support the unemployment insurance trust program. You get laid off through no fault of your own. I want there to be a safety net to make sure you have support. But I think it's a bridge too far to say employers now have to pay unemployment insurance for their workers who go on strike against them. And, and so this is where I think this is my political challenge, right, Jonathan, is, is when you are socially liberal, I line up with the Democrats on the social values, women's reproductive rights and marriage equality. We line up on the importance of climate change. Like we line up on gun responsibility. But when it gets into these tax and fiscal issues, yes, I am very vocal about pushing back. And so it's not a surprise to me that they're going to be more supportive of Bob Ferguson because he is fiscally liberal as well as socially liberal. I think the question for voters is who are they going to pick when their ballots show up this week? Because if they want more of the same, I mean, Bob Ferguson is the definition of a fourth term of Jay Inslee. He's endorsed by Jay Inslee. Like I have in my 2020 Senate race, because I wasn't rubber stamping a lot of the proposals that he was putting forward to the legislature. And so this is the challenge. But I will say a lot of that challenge, Jonathan, falls on the independents and the Republican voter, because I know a lot of Republicans who agree with me on supporting women's reproductive rights. They agree with me on the importance of gay marriage. And so the question is, I'm actually the candidate they line up with better than their own candidates when it comes to values. The question is, will they actually vote for the candidate that lines up with their values in their primary ballot? Or are they just going to default back to the saying, OK, I'm going to vote for a Republican? Because I think the the reality in the state of Washington, our current political climate is I don't see the Republicans having a path to beat Bob Ferguson because they're on the wrong side of these social values that 75 percent of Washington voters think are sacrosanct. And, and so this is the challenge for the Republican candidates. And I think for the Republican voters filling out their primary ballots, this is the question. Are they just going to vote for the letter? Are they actually going to vote for the candidate who probably more aligns with their own value set? And we'll see when the returns come in. And, and in my mind, I just wanted to make sure voters had that option to vote for someone who operates in a bipartisan manner, has been in Olympia for 12 years. I've been chairing the capital budget. I'm the Senate rep on the Washington State Investment Board. I chair Jay Lark, our Joint Legislative Audit Review Committee. I have senior positions in the legislature because I actually take the time to listen to a wide variety of voices. And I come up with solutions that actually have broad support from urban and rural communities, from Western and Eastern Washington. And it'll be, 
I look forward to the voters having the final say because polls are polls. It's a popularity contest. Let's be honest. Mullet's a bad haircut from the 80s, not somebody people know about. But when you show up in Olympia and you find bipartisan solutions and then you pass bills that have broad support, that does not get you on the front page of the paper. Like you think about D.C. Everyone knows about Marjorie Taylor Greene but they know about AOC, right? You know about the extremes of either party. The people who show up and just get their work done, I'm not doing it because I want to be on the front page of the paper. I just want good public policy that has broad support across the state of Washington. And, and so this will be, I think, a chance for voters to acknowledge that work and we'll see how it goes. And if it goes my way, I'll be ecstatic. I, my whole plan here is to get in the top two because I feel I would have that bipartisan coalition that could actually beat Bob Ferguson. And if you're being honest, I think with anybody, they were to say who's the one candidate if they got out of the primary in the top two on August 6th has a chance to beat Bob. I think I'm the only one. I think I'm the only one. And we'll just see whether voters choose that or, or whether they just default back to their normal, I'm going to vote for the letter next to their name mentality. Well, Senator Mullet, I do appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate all right. it. All right. Thank you. I would, I would say go Zags, but I'm a U-Dub guy, so <laughs> okay, I can't say right. Now I'm just costing we myself can. votes in Spokane. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.